Um, my name is Amber Salzman, and I lead the Stop ALD Foundation. And joining me, who will also be presenting, is Elisa Seeger, and she leads the Aid and Jack Seeger Foundation. Next slide. So just as a reminder, you must enter your audio pin, otherwise when the presentation's over, you won't be unmuted and you won't be able to ask questions. In addition to being able to ask questions after the presentation, you can type questions into the question box and they will come up while we are speaking and we'll do the best to address them. If they're not um, relevant to today's talk, uh, we will try to handle it after the webinar. So just as a reminder, except for myself and Elisa, nobody else will be able to speak. And yes, I do feel that power. Okay, next slide. Um, just as a disclaimer, this is not uh, any medical, it's not intended to give medical advice, this is just an information only webinar. Next slide. Okay, so what we're going to cover today is uh, first just to remind everyone why newborn screening is so critical and how it saves lives. We'll cover the availability of the test to be able to screen newborns. We'll explain how newborn screening is done in the U.S., both at the federal level, what's done at the federal level, and then how it gets implemented on a state-by-state -state level. And we'll give the status of the ALD uh, screen at the federal level as well as the um, state level. And we'll also give some uh, advice on how to uh, go forward with it. Next slide. Okay, so um, this slide is a reminder, a stark reminder of how critical newborn screening is. These pictures are from my family. The adorable boy on the left is Oliver Lapin. He's my nephew. He was diagnosed when he was eight years old had a heart of gold, spoke three languages, just charming, you know, had a whole life ahead of him. Unfortunately, he was diagnosed at eight with ALD. At the time, my son Spencer was one year old. If you look at the pictures on the right panel, those are my son Spencer, and this isn't an opportunity for a mother to brag about her son, but to just show what happens when there's a screen. So my son knew about it when he was one due to Oliver's diagnosis. He was treated at age two, and now at age 15, I mean, just look at him. He's the picture of health, although he did get worried that I put a slide with some sweat stain on it, but it just showed that he can work up a steam. And he's also in a very demanding school, an honors bio, and he's very, very interested in science. And the picture on the bottom is when a physician at CHOP agreed to take him in uh, to an open heart surgery so that he could watch that close up. Um, every day he honors Oliver's name and we are thankful for the diagnosis that Oliver provided. However, this is a stark reminder that screening saves lives. If there was a screen around when Oliver was born, he could be here with us to enjoy contributing back to society as my son does. So it just, again, stark pictures in terms of what happens when you don't have a screen and when you do have a screen. Next slide. Okay, so there is a screen. That's why at this point it's very frustrating that not every single newborn is screened. Uh, Ann Mosier and Walter Hubbard published on the method for screening newborns back in 2009. It showed that the technique was very sensitive and very specific. And the Mayo team improved upon it by making a high throughput screen, and they worked with Ann. And Ann Mosier and the Mayo team published the results of that high throughput method earlier this year. And um, I neglected to mention these slides will be made available online, and I left in the references so that you can read about the screens that are available. Next slide. So how do we implement that screen? It's clearly needed. There is a test, why aren't we doing it? So the way it works in the US is the Secretary of Health and Human Services is the person responsible for adding conditions to what's known as the recommended uniform screening panel. Now, adding a condition to the recommended uniform screening panel, or the RUSP, 
only means that the federal government recommends that each state screen for the condition. So the government, the federal government does not have the jurisdiction to implement it, but they do have the jurisdiction to recommend what each state should do. Now, how does the Secretary of Health and Human Services come to this recommendation? She, ha she or he have an advisory committee on heritable diseases in newborns and children, and that committee brings recommendations forward to the Secretary. Next slide. So the way something goes forward to that committee is a condition gets nominated. And when a condition is nominated, it has to show that there is potential benefit of screening for that condition, that the technology exists for states to screen for the disorder, and if you identified a newborn, there would be an effective treatment for them. So once that nomination meets those three criteria, and the advisory committee moves it forward, it then goes to what's known as an external condition review group for a more in-depth analysis. Now making it past that first screen so that the advisory committee then refers it to another committee is quite a huge hurdle, and not many have made it through that hurdle. The external condition review group then does a thorough analysis, consults with the experts, reads the literature, and brings a recommendation forward to the committee. I put a note at the bottom so that if you Google this committee or you read about it, you may at times see the nomenclature DACHDNC, which is the discretionary committee, and it's really the same committee. It was just at a certain time the funding for the SACHDNC uh, was not in place, it ran out, and it wasn't renewed, so the Secretary of Health and Human Services put a discretionary committee in place. So they're really the same committee, and if you read about it, they are equivalent. Next slide. Okay, so if it makes it through the Secretary's Advisory Committee to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, and it gets added to the RUSP, the states then can decide what to do with it. So states determine what disorders they're going to screen for in their state. Now, in some states, it's recommended that all the newborns are screened for what's on the RUSP. And in most states, newborns are screened for most of the disorders on the RUSP. However, it takes years for a new condition to be adopted by each state. So just because it's added to the RUS doesn't mean right away it gets added to the state screening. And I'll give examples on that. Now, in addition to screening for what the federal government recommends, there are some states that screen for additional disorders that are not on the RUSP. So they may choose to do it in advance of something being added on the RUSP, or they may just choose to do it because they just feel passionately that it's the right thing to do for their state, and despite it not being recommended at a federal level, they're going to screen for it in their state. So in some ways, you're at the mercy of which state you're born in as to whether you're going to be screened for particular disorders. Next slide. So what's the status of ALD in terms of uh, being on the list of conditions that the federal government recommends? So we put forward the nomination back in early 2012. And at the time we put the nomination forward, as you recall, there was the paper published by Ann Moser and Walter Hubbard. And um, the screen was validated. But the way it was validated was um, previously known ALD samples were, were put in in a blinded way, so they were also put through with other non-affected samples, and it showed that the test worked. So in a retrospective fashion, the test was validated at the time that we put the nomination in. And the nomination was supported by many ALD foundations and was done in collaboration with the scientists and clinicians working in this area. So even though we put it in, I believe, in February, it wasn't reviewed until September. And at that time, the committee agreed that ALD is the medically important disorder. We had a well-established case definition. There was the screening, diagnostic, and treatment protocols. 
However, the reason they decided not to move it forward was because they didn't believe there was sufficient prospective data available in terms of checking the validity of the test. They knew that at the time that the nomination was being reviewed, Mayo was doing a pilot on 100,000 samples coming from California where they were prospectively testing for ALD and several other disorders. So at the September 2012 committee meeting, it was not approved to move forward to the external condition committee. Next slide. So we resubmitted it again in September 2013. This time we had the results of the Mayo pilot, which were very encouraging. And uh, even though we submitted it in September 2013, it wasn't reviewed until January 2014. And at that time, it was moved to the external condition review group. And that is a big milestone for a condition to pass. Now, frustrating as it was, despite it being approved in January 2014 to go to the external condition review group, that group didn't really start working on it right away. And the first time that the committee received an update from that condition review group was just this past February. At that time, the committee had not yet consulted with ALD experts, and the update they provided to the committee was very preliminary. I mean, just as an example, when they explained the disease and treatments, et cetera, they didn't fully appreciate how important it was to diagnose adrenal insufficiency prior to an adrenal crisis, and they didn't seem to realize how many lives that could have saved. So after that meeting, um, many of us provided them with names of experts. They've done some more. Uh, they've reached out to them, and they've done more uh, digging in terms of the right articles to be reviewing and consulting with the right people. And I was told offline that the committee is supposed to vote in August, at their August meeting, as to whether it should go forward to the Secretary of Health and Human Services. So if they stick to their timeline and they vote in August, and all indications are very positive that it should go forward, if it does go forward, then Secretary Burwell will have to confirm that it gets added to the ROSP. Next slide. Now, as encouraging as it is to be put onto the recommended uniform screening panel, it's only a prerequisite, but it's not sufficient for implementation. And as an example, since this process has been in place, which has been about 10 years, only three conditions have been added. So SCID was added in 2010, uh, critical congenital heart disease was added in 2011, and Pompeii was just added recently. If you looked at each state, that not many have implemented them. And there's a huge amount of effort going into implementing uh, the earlier ones, in particular SCID. There's a very uh, well-organized foundation pushing that to get implemented at each state, and it's still not available in every state, but it is getting out there. Um, so it takes many years and a lot of work to implement conditions at a state level. So again, the, the federal uh, recommendation is a prerequisite, but insufficient. Moving to the next slide. So we have to move to state implementation. We've got to put a lot of effort to implement what is being recommended at the federal level. So each state's newborn screening program needs to be engaged. Now, most states have their own lab and their own equipment, but some of them uh, send their samples to another state. So there's, for example, a New England consortium where I think it's five states send their samples all to Massachusetts to do it. However, the decision of what to screen for is still done at each state. So if Vermont decides that they are going to screen, then they will send it to Massachusetts to do the screening for them. So each state has their own newborn screening program, and each state has their own health department, and each state obviously has their own politicians. And all of these uh, parties need to be engaged to make sure that we push this forward and that it is implemented as soon as possible rather than waiting until it just slowly trickles into each state. 
So with that, I'm going to transition it over to Elisa Seeger so that she can talk about the state implementation. Hi, my name is Elisa Seeger, and I am the founder of the Aiden Jack Seeger Foundation in honor of my son. Um, I just want to start by telling you a little bit about our story and Aiden. Aiden was born in 2004, a beautiful, healthy child. Um, he went on to play sports, be very active, did very well in school. Um, until his first grade year, later in the year, he started having vision problems around March. And, you know, we spent a lot of time going through ophthalmologists, pediatric ophthalmologists, back to the doctor, pediatrician, finally the neurologist where we got the diagnosis of ALD, something we had never heard about. Um, Aiden was progressed in the disease, but luckily, or we thought, um, he was still eligible for transplant. So our family moved down to Duke University, and we spent seven, year, uh, seven, years, seven months down at Duke inpatient. Aiden did receive a bone marrow transplant, um, but unfortunately, because he was so far progressed in the disease, he lost all of his abilities. Um, now, the tra as far as the transplant, that part was successful. Aiden was 99% donor cells, but he did not have a good outcome because the disease was already so far. So seven months down at Duke, we were then transferred to NYU in New York and um, he passed away in April 29th of 2012. He spent the last 10 months of his life in the hospital. And during that time when I found out that there was a test, a newborn screening test available for this, I was just, just you know, there are no words. Um, why were we not doing it? I know that if this was available in 2004, that my son would be here right now and so many other boys. So that leads to my passion about making this happen in every state. So late 2012, I started the process. And 11 months to the day, um, Aiden's law was signed in New York State. New York State started testing December 30th of 2013. And in our first year of testing, 250,000 babies, we had 20 positives and zero false positives. Just proof that the test is working and saving so many lives, giving these families the information they need to save their children. So where do I start? I have to just give you a background that I knew nothing about how getting, how, what was the first step of getting a bill? What was, you know, turning that into a law? So everything I learned, you know, it was definitely a process in that. Um, go to babiesfirsttest.org. That's a really great website. If you put your state in, it will tell you all the diseases that your state tests for. And then it will also give you the contacts for your newborn screening program. I use New York as an example, but this will give you everything. So Michelle is the director of the lab, and then Beth handles the genetics of it. So all the information is right there for you. And with that, you can start by calling the lab, finding out what they test for, finding out do they even know what ALD is, are they willing to test for it, just getting that information to start with. Secondly, I would definitely say try to contact your state commissioner of health. Try to set up a meeting. Um, you know, this might be a difficult task, of course, but if you can't get a meeting, uh, write a letter voicing your concerns, and then don't be discouraged with a negative response. I actually had um, Assemblyman Brennan, who was one of the sponsors on Aiden's bill, write a letter to the Commissioner of Health. And that at least got us a response letter back, even though it seemed to be the stock letter, but, you know, just to make the Commissioner of Health at least aware of what we were doing and put it on his radar. So legislative support, where do you go from there? Go to openstates.org. That's a wonderful website. All you need to do is put your address in 
and it'll give you your local representative and your senator that's responsible for handling your area. Contact them, set up the meeting, you know, tell them about ALV. Um, the most important thing as well when you do set up these meetings is to bring documentation. So get a folder, start putting all of these things together. And the most important thing I have to say is your story. So with that, this is an example of what I had in my package. A picture of Aiden and our story. And again, short, but just to make them understand what we went through and how having this test is so important to saving lives. So again, sharing your personal story will be the most important thing. Include in that package a definition of ALD. Now, of course, you know, the legislators probably have no idea what ALD is. Um, so that's a really important part. Include letters of medical support. I have to say, going into these legislators, of course, they're very sympathetic. But you need the facts to back it up. And with that, you know, we have letters from Minnesota, from Duke, Mass General, Stanford, Montefiore, Mount Sinai, Cornell, Kennedy, Krieger. So all of these institutions would be more than happy to address a letter to the Commissioner of Health of your state. That's all available. And then I would also recommend as well to get one of your state institution support, because I'm sure a lot of the legislators will look for that. In my package, I also tried to include other family stories. I wanted to make them aware that this is prevalent. Um, it does happen often. And this is a picture of Steve and his mother, Lee. And Steve was diagnosed at about six and a half, and he was too late for treatment. And this is Steve now. Um, Steve is about 15. And he needs round-the-clock care. He is in a hospital bed with a feeding tube and intubated and, you know, frequent visits to the hospital and all of that comes with it. Um, this is Joshua's story. And Joshua's story was so important to share in my package as well because he died from an adrenal crisis. His family thought he had a fever and Basically, he died in his father's arms because of it. Joshua was two years old. Um, and if this was available for him, obviously, he could have been alive today with just, you know, a pill that cost pennies. So bringing that to their attention as well is extremely important. So then this is a list of some other bullet points. So with my package, I always had the stories with the pictures and then on the other side, I had a bullet point list of what ALD was and then just the facts. So the cost of adding ALD to the state's newborn screening panel is minimal compared to the cost of caring for the boys that have been diagnosed too late. And just for example, it costs the state of New York under $500,000 to test 250,000 babies last year. My son's medical bills for 10 months were over $4 million. So if this was available in 2004 and for so many other boys, just not only are you saving lives, which is the most important thing, but the state is saving money. Um, so the actual cost. Now, this will depend, obviously, state by state and what type of equipment they have, what kind of newborn screening facilities they have. So one of the important questions to ask when you do contact the lab is, does your state have the equipment necessary to perform the test? And if not, are they willing to outsource to another state? And this makes sense for a lot of the smaller states, such as Connecticut. Um, a cost analysis detailing the cost of the equipment, the technicians, and other testing needs can be done. So that's something easy that can be done for each state to just give them an idea or an estimate of what it will cost to actually introduce this. So this is an example of a cost analysis that I had done for Connecticut. And when you look at the numbers, I mean, it's such a minimal amount of money. The first one has 
um, Connecticut actually purchasing the equipment because they do not have it, um, which year one would be about $800,000, and that goes down substantially year two, three, four, five. Um, and then in the next box is New York State actually doing the testing, which would be an option as well. And with that, the cost is even less. So again, depending on your state and how many babies are born, you'll have a lot of different options to um, present. So I want to talk a little bit about getting a lobbyist. Um, I was lucky with my father-in-law that had contacts, and we did have a lobbyist. Uh, the lobbyist was wonderful. They worked pro bono, um, and they were extremely helpful, of course, to get us the meetings. But I do want to say, please do not rely solely on the lobbyist. I think people may assume that either if you're paying for a lobbyist or you're getting a lobbyist pro bono, they are doing the work for you but they are not. You are the ones that know your stories. You are the ones that are the advocates. You are the ones that have the information and the passion to make this happen. So rely on the lobbyists for if you cannot get a meeting with someone, they have the contacts to get you the meeting. Or if you have a question about strategy or what you're doing, great, go to them with that. But do not rely solely on them to get this done, because that will not happen. So once you do get a bill, um, that will usually go to the health committee floor. Um, so what I did after I got the initial bill on both the Senate and the Assembly side is I targeted both health committees, so the Senate Health Committee and the Assembly Health Committee. And I got a list of the members, and I started contacting them from meetings, phone calls, whatever I could get. I sent them packages in the mail. Um, and that was extremely important as well because, I mean, as you know, these legislators have 100 things on their desk on any given day. So you need to do the work for uh -huh. them. You need to give them the information that they need to make this happen. Um, once you give them the information, they have it handy. They can refer to it. So again, this package was such an important part of what I was doing. When you do get meetings, you might not always be meeting with that representative or that senator. You may be meeting with a legislative aide. You may be dealing with a chief of staff. So with that, leaving that package with them so they can talk about it at a later date is really important. If you're just talking to one person, they'll never remember what your story was. So press. Press was really important for us here in New York as well, just to help to get the word out and you know not only raise awareness, but raise awareness for what we were doing trying to get the bill passed into law. So we were lucky. We had some TV coverage, some newspaper coverage, some radio coverage, and all of that really helped us to push this forward. So here's some of the bullet points. Again, I talked about earlier, um, you know, the, the family pictures and the stories, and then on the second page, to make it easy for anyone that's reading this package. Here are some of the bullet points I have listed. So over 80% of the diseases currently listed on the rough are rarer than ALD. So with ALD, it is crucial for an early diagnosis and treatment options are in place. You need to let them know that. One in 17,000 babies will be diagnosed with ALD, so that's an estimated 235 babies every year, or one baby born every 36 hours. If you needed to find out how many babies are born in your state so you can figure out what the estimate would be, go to this website. It has a state by state and how many births per year. So the ALD newborn screening test. Um, that has proven to be accurate with a false positive of less than 0.1%. And then 90% of the boys with ALD will also have adrenal insufficiency. And again, as we know, adrenal insufficiency can lead to death, but if it was diagnosed, it's something that can be easily treated with a pill that costs pennies. 
um, the studies, you know, there's papers that have been done concluding that transplant prior to being symptomatic is the key to having a successful outcome. Goes back to the early diagnosis and why we need newborn screening. That would be the only way to find out. And then, of course, again, the cost effectiveness for treating pre-symptomatic boys as opposed to symptomatic boys. Usually, the boys that are going in early um, have the best chance to go back to a normal, healthy life, as Spencer did. Um, boys that are late, as Aiden was, um, do not have the same circumstances. So what happens? once a baby is diagnosed with ALD? I'm sure the legislators will ask you that question, that question about what will happen. Um, on February 12th of 2015, New York State published an ALD newborn screening manuscript. And in the manuscript, it outlines in detail what the steps should be once a baby is diagnosed. This manuscript is so important and can be used and applied in every state in the country. So this paper tells you diagnostic guidelines, surveillance protocols, when treatment should be initiated, um, materials for parents so they can read more about it, and then, of course, long-term long follow-up um, after that. And then finally, here is just a list of states and um, advocates that are active in those states. So if anyone is listening and part of any of these states here, they can reach out to people and work together. I mean, if you can get a team of people, that would be much easier to um, put a game plan together and make this happen. So that was, yes, and this is the last one. Um, yep, so I have to say it is definitely a commitment but it can be done. And again, don't be discouraged. Just keep moving forward, and there's always a way around things. So thank you. And if there are any questions, please let us know. Uh, Alisa, you, there's no questions sent in, right? And um, Ina, I don't. Do you... Okay, and Ina, do you have any questions that have come your way that we should address? No, I don't. Um, I don't see any questions. Um, there is a question, should we be contacting the RUSP to encourage them? Um, well, right now, um, I'll take that. I guess it's a question of should we deal with the external committee that's doing the analysis and coming back with the recommendation? Uh -huh. And um, right now, we probably should not reach out to them. Um, the last time I talked to Alex Kemper, who leads that committee, he said there was some sensitivity because it, he can't appear to be um, solicited or uh, we have to be careful. So um, I said I will send you an email with the experts in ALD, and they were reached out to. Um, if I'll tell you what would what always does help. At every secretary's advisory committee, there's always a time for public comment, and I think it does make a difference when families come, and you don't have to be there in person. Usually you can phone in. If you can come, it's in Washington. And if you give your family story and just remind them how critical this is, and every 48 hours that they're not screening, another child is born with ALD unknowingly submitted to a horrible, uh, devastating future without being screened, um, it helps to go and, and be spoken. And, and and speak on behalf. 
So uh, you can look at the HRSA website. The next meeting is the, the week of May 11th. Um, so I, I would always encourage people to join the public comment session and make, make the case. I mean, they, they, they have to face me if they say no. And I've been going to that committee, you know, since this nomination went in, and I can tell you that the committee members comment to me. They're like, don't worry, it's going forward. They know that they're working on behalf of people like us. And our families, and we've seen the devastating effects of not screening and the um, wonderful consequences of being able to have an early notification and the outcome. Any other questions? I don't see any questions on my end. I just see a comment um, that says 20 hits in the newborn screening out of 250,000 argues a frequency of 1 in 12,500. This means that ALD is underestimated with current statistics. Um, we have to be careful because 250,000 sounds like a lot, but it's still small numbers in a way. I mean, they, they won't know for a few years. You know, they don't feel comfortable saying that. That might be year one results, but, you know, it'll take a few years to get the true estimate. There's a question of, do you know the status of newborn screening outside of the U.S.? I know that the Netherlands, right, was it the Netherlands yes. has just decided to um, start testing? Well, it's moving forward uh, through the, it's, it's being planned, but all the, all the committees so far have been positive, so that's going forward, yes. Mm -hmm. And there's some efforts going into other countries. I haven't heard any positive um, results yet. But, for example, in France and England and Australia, people have been trying to pursue it. So I guess um, there's also a comment uh, from someone saying that the Netherlands will be testing, but only in boys, not in girls. That's correct. Okay. Yes. There is this, con uh, this view that um, because right now there is no treatment for carriers, that um, they're not going to notify them. Hopefully that will change over time. So please answer the short survey you'll receive after the web webinar. And for further feedback, please email comments, questions, and or concerns to admin at aldconnect.org. And do feel free to reach out to Elisa and I if there's uh, ways that you can move forward the implementation of newborn screening. Yes, if anyone needs help, please reach out to us. 